contemplation before chanting. The Sangha is invited to come back to our breathing so that the collective energy of mindfulness will bring us together as an organism, going as a river with no more separation. Let the whole Sangha breathe as one body, chant as one body, listen as one body, transcending the boundaries of a deliso self, liberating us from the superior complex, the inferior complex, and the equality complex.
Testing, testing. Can you hear me well? Yes. So good morning, everybody. Um, today, um, Tevapton is um, supposed to give Dhamma talk, but he feel uh, not uh, sufficiently well in English, so he asked me to uh, to give a Dhamma talk for you. Uh, so I didn't get time to prepare a little bit. Um, I heard that there are a group of meditators coming uh, today. Can you raise your hand a little bit so I can know? Okay. Um, so uh, there are a couple extra cushions uh, if you can uh, sit a little bit closer, more on this side because I'm, I'm going to use a lot of board. So, uh, and unfortunately, uh, the board is not big enough, so the, the word or character are very small. So if you sit very far, it's hard to see. So uh, maybe we can uh, listen to the free sound of the bell first. Just uh, sit comfortably and uh, just enjoy our breath.
So dear Thay, dear community, dear Sangha, um, today is uh, Sunday, July 30th, the year 2017, and we are in a big togetherness meditation hall at the uh, Brooklyn Monastery. Uh, I think this may be uh, when the last Dhamma talk um, uh, until we uh, start the U.S. tour which is coming uh, around uh, after August uh, 18. And uh, we, we have about uh, two weeks of uh, community work, uh, working to prepare for the, the ground and uh, premises for the U.S. tour. So any uh, friend who would like to come and join us to, to help to uh, do some community work, you're welcome. You can check the information on the website. Yeah. Um, one, one of the two uh, big sutra that uh, our teacher has uh, mentioned several times uh, with us in, the, in his teaching, it has to do with the breathing sutra and the uh, sutra for foundation of mindfulness. Uh, so I thought today I uh, revisit a little bit uh, the uh, eighth first uh, exercise of uh, the Breathing Sutra, uh, Anapanasati Sutra, uh, with the more emphasis on its application and how I, I see it in, in my daily life. So the f first two um, area or eight exercise of Breathing Sutra have to do with uh, being aware of the body and uh, being aware of the feelings, whether it's uh, uh, positive, uh, negative, uh, neutral feelings. So the first uh, breathing exercise breathing in I know I'm breathing in, or you can say I'm aware. Of in breath. And breathing out, I'm aware of my out breath. So we are breathing all the time, but how much do we pay attention to that? And that is the, the point of uh, contention, is we can uh, take off the other distraction in our life and be focused more on the breath, on the in-breath, our breath. And, and we know the, um, the breath tied together the, uh, our body and our mind. Often our body is here, but our mind think a lot about something else. So it wander around. So using the breath, we, we bring it back to our body. So it being in one unit together. Uh, for example, I remember I, uh, I just uh, chant together with the Sangha. Uh, so there are different parts I pay attention to the word of the chanting on the, on the paper. But also part of my mind was uh, kind of preparing to give a Dhamma talk. So I have uh, some information in my head about you know, what I'm going to say, something like that. Uh, so it, it's a normal process of how the mind works. But how much motivation, how much concentration you want to, to use to apply it. Uh, so, but you get to the point when you have so much distraction that you kind of lose the present moment. You can lose your own self. You know. So the second exercise is uh, breathing in. I follow my breath.
all the way. And breathing out, I follow my breath all the way. So this is more sustained mindfulness uh, that bring about concentration. Uh, so for example, like say if you have um, uh, a pen here, and if you apply your mind into your breathing, and you say, breathing in, I forgot to feed my cat. <laughs> so there are other things like that, you know. So I think the thing is you, you need to stay and put your mind on your breath and follow through. So in, in and then out, out. And during the time, you just let go of your thinking. So it's just an exercise. I remember when I was uh, uh, learning how to swim. Uh, I remember I have to jump in the water and swallow a cup of water <laughs> and not know how to do it. And then uh, later on, uh, I stay on the, on the side of the swimming pool and we do some exercise. We're not moving anywhere, we're just, uh, just keeping doing the movement and uh, regulate what our breathing <coughs> until it become common, become automatic. So I think what this talk is today is about is what we do as automatic mode versus our voluntary mode. Uh, of course, you know, we, in the learning process, like learning how to ride a bicycle, we have to struggle and pay attention, sustain concentration for a little while, wobbling in the bicycle until you get all the iron movement done, and then after that, it's stored in our subconsciousness. The next time you go on a bicycle, you don't have to worry, you already learn it. But the thing is, often you might learn something like a negative uh, emotions and habit energy, negative habit energy, and it's stored on subconsciousness. And it automatically trigger. I remember sometime uh, when we have a conversation with, between the, some of the brother and sister, uh, somebody say something that are uh, aggravating and the other person respond right away because it tickles something. And if, if we know, we practice, we would pause a little bit and choose the option not to respond. Uh, so some of these uh, automatic thing uh, apparently it's good for us. Like you know, the baby doesn't know how to walk, and uh, now as an adult, we walk just natural. Uh, it's automatic. But then, how much you put your attention into the mindfulness of walking, being aware of it. So the third exercise is uh, breathing in. I'm aware of my whole body. And breathing out, I'm aware of my whole body. So that also different part of the body too. So you will see sometime, uh, say if I have a little bit tension and I see there was a kind of tension in my wrist, I kind of shake a little bit just to let it go. Uh, and you know, some of my knees I can adjust. And like that. Uh, often we are so busy in our life that we don't pay attention and uh, uh, different uh, stress tension just accumulate inside the body. 
and what sometimes we have uh, exercise as a deep relaxation, we uh, scan the body. Uh, having some exercise in the morning, like uh, yoga, uh, uh, qigong, uh, uh, ten stick movement, I think that helps a lot. So uh, there's a number to that, so one, two, three, four. So breathing in, breathing out, I release the tension in my body. So these four exercises have to do with, with the body. Uh, breath being, being a central part of the body. And then the next four exercises have to do with the feelings. So the same, you say, uh, breathing in, out. I'm aware of feeling of joy. We have deep in our subconsciousness the capacity to have joy, to be light, elated. But often because we rehash our suffering, something will go wrong and we just focus on that and we rehearse it all the time. So often learn how to let go of our thought and just to pay attention to what is already happening well in our body. Uh, for example, like uh, a couple weeks ago is uh, very hot and usually for me to give them a talk, I need to put a scarf and I put on the thing and a jacket and it is real hot uh, I will sweat and I will be able to wear. So now I'm happy that uh, today is very uh, uh, cool so I can wear all my thing and not to worry. And that's just a small example. My heart is still feel well. My knees are good. Uh, I did a small walk after uh, dinner last night. And, uh, and I think it's wonderful to be alive and, and healthy. So. These are the things we take for granted. So if we can add a little bit to that element of uh, joy and uh, happiness. So the, the next exercise is uh, breathing in. I'm aware of my feelings of happiness. So joy is sometimes has a lot of up and down. It conditional and um, you can say uh, happiness is a sustaining joy and is less dependent on a lot of outside element. Uh, and I think by, by continue to water the good seeds of our positive feelings, uh, we can be a more uh, happy person. Uh, and of course, we need a co-practitioner, a good environment to help us do that. And then when, when you water the good seeds enough, so this is more like a work of the gardener. If you, you, you water your good seed of tomato plant, of uh, cauliflower or something like that, the thing that you want to grow. 
And then now we deal with uh, the negative feelings. So breathing in and out, I'm aware. of negative feeling. So negative feeling mean um, any of those like uh, sadness, anger, fear, anxiety, frustration, The reason why we, we uh, stop with the joy and happiness first is we want to make sure that we are well grounded, we are stable, and able to deal with our pain, with our suffering. Like a cumulatively um, sadness and, and, uh, and uh, stress and lack of sleep sometimes can lead to depression, for example, and it's accumulated. So I think by, by having a little bit dose of joy and happiness every day, we water the good seed of stability, of calmness, of, um, how you say, uh, uh, resilient. So when there are little sadness and something calm to us, we're not totally weighed down by such a sadness or, or fear or anger. And then the last is uh, breathing in and breathing out. I calm, I transform my feelings. In the sutra, I say embracing the feeling, but also it's a p part of the healing process. And when you know where those uh, feelings come from, you can transform them. So the first four of the side have to do with the body, being aware of the body. Uh, you are aware of it, you follow through the breath, and you notice your body, and you take to release stress and tension in the body. Uh, the next four of the side having to do with the feelings. So we are aware of the positive uh, feeling first, uh, being joy and happiness. So you have a grounded uh, instability and calmness, and then you deal with your negative feelings, and you are aware of it first, and you embrace them and transform them. Through the process, this, the whole process, you have to understand where does it come from, what the causes of, of the suffering. And once you know the cause and the understanding, you bring the light in mindfulness into that, and. Uh, concentration inside and you can transform them. So I've been um, reading a little bit about uh, modern psychology because we learn a lot about Buddhist psychology with our teacher. And I think about how, how, how our brain is working. Uh, so I think if you look at my, my hand, uh, this is the picture of like, the brain. Uh, we have uh, at least three main parts. There's a lot of smaller parts in that. So this is the spinal cord back, back wall here. And within my, my thumb here, if I fold it, uh, this is what we call, sometimes we call mammalian brain. If you fold inside, and then you wrap, you wrap your, your hand around it, and this is a cerebral cortex. 
So this is like a hard disk that we developed much later. It contained a lot of information into that uh, processing center about thinking and all the things. But uh, common to many uh, animals, uh, because sometimes some scientists call before, even though now it's more developed, uh, this is what we call a reptilian brain. So when, when our ancestor as a reptile uh, started, they, they used that for locomotion and you know, uh, basic survival, eating, mating, and, and some of the basic thing. And then later on, they live in herd in a group, and they learn how to deal with hierarchy, uh, having to deal with how, how you select your mate and how you live in a troop, in a herd. Uh, so these uh, have to do with emotion a lot. Uh, so that's what we call a limbic system. Uh, so today I, I talk a lot about this limbic system. And then after that it, we grow through uh, millions of years as uh, apes or primates and then uh, human beings and we develop more uh, cerebral cortex outside. So sometimes, these sometimes people refer to as a paleo uh, cortex, and, and this as more neo cortex. So we, within this, this uh, limbic system, there is uh, a gland, which is very important, uh, we call the hippocampus. Uh, the reason the scientists call because when they uh, discover and they look at it, it looked like a, uh, a horse, uh, a fish, what do you call it? Seahorse. Seahorse, sea yeah, that's seahorse, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that, that's what they call it. And this, this like the conductor of all the things that's happening in the gland inside uh, our limbic system. I'm sorry, I think the, the name is hypothalamus. The hippocampus is the, the different organs. Of the so the, the hypothalamus, the name is um, because it's underneath another gland they call the thalamus gland which I think I will describe much later. <coughs> the hypothalamus is the coordinator, the conductor of all the things happening in our limbic system, which is the, like a CPU of our uh, brain. Uh, it is said the hypothalamus is the, the border between the unconscious level of the brain versus the conscious activity of the brain. It makes the determination whether which one become conscious, which one will be left alone, which is on automatic consciousness. So there is an automatic system of regulating our body. Like now, uh, I don't have to do anything my body automatically digests the food. And if I uh, eat too much sugar, my body would regulate it uh, through the kidney, through different organ to, uh, to create uh, insulin or something to just to, uh, to take away the, the extra sugar from the blood system. And I don't think you order, they, they know what to do. Uh, the same, I don't have to give order to my lung to breathe, they know what to breathe. All I need just to put a little bit uh, extra attention and be aware is to the breathing. So, in this area unconscious is like we say in the paleo cortex. And the, on the other side, the conscious activity which we, voluntary action, we, is uh, regulated by the neocortex which we choose to add 
that mindfulness, that attention into our system. So we, within the hypothalamus, uh, it sent out information hormone to the endocrine gland with the pituitary gland, which uh, release different order to the body. Like I say, and the thing is, it's happened without our knowledge. Of course, we can study, we'll be more aware of what's happening in our body. And that's, that's the whole idea about being aware of, of the body through using our breath. So within this, we, we have what we call autonomous nervous system, uh, in short for ANS. And that's what I meant by autonomous ner nervous system here. And within the autonomous nervous system, they have a system of uh, gas pedal and brakes. Uh, it, uh, it moves the body. So in this side, we have a, I'm not sure what the word, excitator. It excites the body. It gives you motivation to perform, to do all kind of things. And it you have almost a role as an accelerator. You push the gas pedal. It, the car go fast. And so it helps us to stay awake, to stay alert, and also it regulates the a fight or flight symptom when we face adversity, we face difficulty, things like that. And in the process, it releases a histamine. And uh, for example, like around this time, uh, uh, myself and a lot of brothers, uh, we have allergy. Uh, allergy to dust, allergy to pollen. So we have to take some, some uh, extra medicine, uh, antihistamine that prevent the histamine from being released too much. And uh, I think there's another acetylcholine uh, which regulate our nervous system, how it's, it motivates our nervous system. The cortisol also and the testosterone uh, within the, the male and uh, estrogen within the female. And the thing is, you want to use a little bit of that sympathetic nervous system, but not too much. Uh, like you cannot run on adrenaline all the time. Uh, sustain uh, adrenaline like in combat situation or in a highly stressful environment uh, after a while, when you are downtime, you develop a lot, a lot of psychological problems, like PTSD and so on. And you, you cannot control your body, you cannot control your hormone regulations and so on. So the, the safe system is the parasympathetic uh, nervous system. So it releases some hormone as a suppressor. So sometimes you're all excited, you, know, you party, and then the surface helps it to calm down a little bit. And it plays the role as an inhibitor. So sometimes uh, after a sustained uh, run or something, and you're out of breath or something, and you, you stop, you rest a little bit, and uh, it's uh, to regulate the body. It takes care of the uh, extra lactic acid and so on. So it, it serves a function as a brakes. So you don't have to accelerate all the time just like a car. Sometimes you have to brake from time to time. And it has a, a benefit uh, in calming uh, different parts of the body. And it helps you to sleep and rest. So. Uh, Adequate uh, sleeping and rest is very important to the body. Uh, I remember Brother Fatma wrote an article about uh, the benefit of having enough uh, sleep. Uh, I think that is, I agree is very important uh, because often we 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 sacrifice our our sleeping for the sake of learning something or something, and then and throughout uh, different period of, of time when we keep on lacking sleep, after a while our nervous system breaks down. We encounter a lot of problems because 
this, this system gets confused. It doesn't know when to release hormone, not to release hormone to, to regulate the body. And this is uh, happened a lot on the unconscious level. So that, that's why having uh, this exercise in applying, sometimes we call uh, mindfulness, concentration, and insight. And we apply to all these exercises, especially our body and the feelings part. And it helps to conserve our energy too. So we don't get excited all the time. We, we um, often, we worry a lot and we worry about something going to happen and we have no control about many things and then the worrying keep uh, going on to the point it becomes very stressful and we, we sap our energy a little bit. So it helps to conserve energy and restore energy and also to repair some damage. So the, the part about sleeping and repair is very important. And also it helped the digestion system. Um, like today, uh, because I know I have to give them a talk, I, I ate very little. So I don't have to, my stomach doesn't have to work hard for digestive food so I can have more clarity in the mind. Uh, so it's up to us to regulate our body and um, to play the role between the conscious and unconscious. Uh, of course, this has happened all the time and it's hard, but to have apply mindfulness into that help us to be aware uh, to all the activities that are going on. Like for example, right now my, my heart is beating and it releases, uh, it circulates the f blood. And if you, if you put uh, a pulse in there, you can see the, your pulse of the blood flow. But how often do we are aware of it? Uh, because we just happen to pay attention to any other thing. So having, being aware of that body and release attention is very important to do the part there. So this is a more detailed uh, picture of how our limbic and uh, system and the cortex system. So we mentioned uh, this is the neocortex, uh, which is the uh, upper part of the uh, the brain. And sometimes we, we can call, even though it's not exactly it, uh, the voluntary nervous system, it's how much we, we use our mind to concentrate on the awareness of our action, to concentrate on the awareness of our body. And around it, wrap around is the, we call paleocortex, which is the limbic system. And within it, there's a lot of organ, but for the moment, I just mentioned a few. Uh, so this is the hypothalamus, which is the conductor to all the things. It, it receives information from the senses. So when, when, when we encounter different information, through our uh, spinal cord, it sends information up 
to the thalamus. It receives all the signal from the five senses, and then it, sometimes it interpret. There's an area they, they send it to um, the, um, for example, for vision, that has a certain area in, in our um, visual perception, how to do it. But then they send information to the hypothalamus. And the, the basal ganglia have to do with the regulation of our body, uh, how to control our, our body, how we walk, how we stand, how we... Uh, for example, the, the fact of standing straight like that, uh, as human we learn through millions of years. Uh, most of the other animals, they, they walk like a monkey or something like that. They, they're not able to have a hips that walk straight and stand, stand straight. And also it helps with the process of memory as well. And this is the, a net of interconnected uh, organs. So there's not, no specific organ is uh, uh, specialized in just one function. They all connect to each other. Uh, our, our scientists know by some time there's some anomaly, some person get a certain part of the organ destroyed uh, or doesn't work and then they figure out, well, this is uh, that role, main role of function of that organ. And this is the two, sometimes I call uh, a good angel and a bad angel. <laughs> uh, the hippocampus and the uh, amygdala. I think that many uh, 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 neuroscientists uh, book that talk a lot about this. The hippocampus actually is a very good system of mindfulness. Uh, it's encoded all the memory that we receive it. Uh, for example, when we have um, a memory of having a, a joyful, happy picnic with our friends or family, uh, the system that enters into the thalamus and go into record a different part of the brain. Uh, some children laugh at something or the grass is green. So the grass is green and a uh, uh, the sky blue is recorded in the visual system of our brain. The children are laughing, or somebody say nice to you, it recorded in the audio uh, area of the brain. Uh, when we say something, it recorded that. And then the, 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 when you taste something good, like a sandwich or something, it tastes so good, you, you have a memory of that. So there are different sections that record different portion of, of the brain. But then when they store, it store a different place. So who is the one who uh, code different information and put into uh, autobiographical memory? And this is the function of hippocampus have to do that. So you can recall it. You say, on July 15, we went on a picnic together at some point or something, and we, they were, who, who are, were there, and what did we do during that time and how, how nice it is. So, and then after that, when you get it, you have to have a decoder as well. So you put all the thing together in, in one film memory kind of thing. So this happened when sometime when Harvard campus was damaged for some reason. It happened when somebody has an experience and then after that it get damaged. So there's no more decoder. <laughs> they didn't couldn't figure it out and remember how to put the thing together. So the, the amygdala help us with our survival. It has to do with primitive emotions, uh, survival, uh, fear, anger, fight or flight. So often when people uh, live in a very stressed environment, this is very much developed and this shrink. So the, the function of, of this as a size that we have here, and also this one too, is to help to create a more serene, beneficial environment uh, inside our brain. So that way the hippocampus can, can work it magic. I remember our teacher who was very mindful all the time. 
sometime there was some retreat and uh, tell them she met him when he was young, around 1966 or something. He, he passed by the campus of the University of Illinois when she was just a teenage. And uh, he was um, giving a series of uh, speech uh, on behalf of um, uh, the war uh, protester to help to end the war. And he recalled that incident. <laughs> and that was like 50 years ago or, or more, 60 years ago. <laughs> and he recalled a joke he was telling uh, after the speech as well. So I mean, uh, it's wonderful if you can be able to, to use uh, uh, mindfulness uh, concentrating inside and be alerted so all the experience we recorded, it stay there and you're able to recall it when you need it. Uh, there was another area about septum pellucida with having to help us to learn new things, but I, we won't get to that. And the cortex para olfactive, which is a very primitive, having to order. Uh, often the order we perceive sometimes affect our judgment without knowing that on an involuntary basis. That's why a lot of people sell perfume. Uh, because it has to do with uh, affecting our, our mood, our feelings, even without our alert, uh, allergic about it. Uh, so I think, um, I think it's back to the time when, um, you know, you sometimes you have some warm in the cave that because they have no light, so they just use the, the sense of smell. Uh, the same with the snakes, uh, they use the tongue as, as a feeler. Uh, to, to, to taste uh, and to use different things. So that, that smell is very important. Uh, and of course, uh, if we can apply uh, mindfulness into that and we counteract like the first feeling we have with that person or the sense of you don't like the smell, or you are more attracted to some kind of smell. So when the hypothesis make a decision, then it send information, it's like it's given order to a servant. <laughs> and this is the pituitary gland, which is the release the hormone what affect the rest of the body. And it can send information to the cerebral spinal system, which is the nervous system, or it can send information to the blood system, circulatory system with the blood. Uh, a lot of time it send information, for example, we don't know, but there are a lot of gland within our body um, for example, our kidney, uh, we think that the kidney uh, regulate uh, just the, uh, the content of uh, our um, fruit system, like blood and so on, but also it has a, a couple of glands on top of our kidney that can release different things. And it works in coordination with uh, the limbic system, the hypothalamus system. So ha having know that for me, it helped to, to switch from autonomous nervous system into the voluntary nervous system. So day in and out, we develop a conscious breath with every breath we do, regardless of what we do, different activity, where you're sitting, you're walking, you're eating, you're talking, you're listening, uh, everything we just pay attention to that awareness. So my, my last part of it. <laughs> So for me, I, I use the special tool I do all the time is to have a mindful breath and a mindful step. And that is very portable. You can take it anywhere. But the thing is, it requires to be a little bit more 
stable and not to overreact to situation. Often we uh, encounter adverse condition, uh, maybe a debate, heated debate, dispute something, and you can lose it a little bit. Uh, you are stressed because of things you have to do and you, you're not aware. But as soon as you can, you can reestablish your calmness, you can reestablish your mindfulness and being aware of what's happening. And also what's happening if, if special, the autonomous system. And to, to do it more on a voluntary basis. Sometimes people call intentional gesture, intentional living. And you have be alerted and having breaks and having pause uh, a lot of time. Uh, our our skill is designed to, to have a breaks uh, after the Lama talk, before we go for a walk. And even you go for a walk also you should have a break. Uh, sometimes we call bathroom break, but it could be also the break for the mind and the body to rest before we eating. So you don't want to jump from strenuous exercise right into eating and uh, after eating right into strenuous activity right away kind of thing. And also have adequate sleep and uh, pay attention to our circadian rhythm. Uh, so also uh, this uh, hypothalamus is also uh, is responsible for regulate our rhythm, uh, the rhythm of the body. Uh, for example, I remember um, on uh, Saturday morning, I think, uh, on Friday night, I, I was so tired after work, I slept very early, early at uh, 9 o'clock, and I wake up at 3 in the morning. <laughs> Uh, because, you know, you just have regular six hours sleep, you know, uh, and then I couldn't sleep uh, again. So it kind of changed my, my, my rhythm a little bit. Uh, and then through the rest of the day, I still can function, but I think uh, my body is more on, on the breaks things. Uh, it had difficulty of uh, being fully alert. And I have to hold on until after lunch, and I came, I, I took a, a nap, and then I restored the thing. Uh, so last night was better. I, I stayed late, I prepared this, and I sleep around 11 o'clock. So I will be able to wake up at 5 and go to the sitting today, kind of thing. So I think in, in your busy life, especially for the lay friend, often you have to be pay attention to that, and sometimes uh, take time for rest. Um, uh, in in Plumberland tradition, we have a Monday as a lazy day, when we purposely don't don't uh, plan anything excessive to do, so we can have a time to rest and uh, just relax and uh, easy. And and for me, for myself, I have to plan everything, so I don't have to rush all the time. So, for example, I, I need to go to the meditation hall early because uh, that rather helped me to set up the, uh, the sound system, the microphone, and so And then uh, I brought the board a little bit early so I don't have to sweat running around carrying all those boards here. So it's just a matter of planning, you know. So you, you have a little more dignity in your life. You have to rush all the time. And of course, like I mentioned, um, you take some rest and you restore your rhythm, especially the fallout of, of rhythm. And uh, also, you can ask your loved one if possible, they can help you from time to time. Uh, I know sometimes being a mother is very stressful. <laughs> you have to sacrifice a lot for your children, for example. And also, you, you make time to reduce the constant stress that can happen to your body. I remember at the time I, I was uh, working and I have an apartment and I had to commute every day. And in the early day, I have to commute one hour and a half on the way to and one and a half on the way back. And I realized, I say, you know, that's a lot of extra time, you know. So uh, in my next job after that, when I get the chance to change my apartment, I get the job first and then I go uh, looking for an apartment as near possible to where I have a job. Uh, of course, I have a park, they have something 
not not too uh, noisy and uh, not too polluted. And then I I will move an apartment. I live in there, so every time I go to work, I don't have to have so much stress, and I can relax it. And I uh, use the extra time I have to study and do something, you know. Uh, and that becomes difficult, especially when you have extra duty and extra responsibility. So the schedule we have is designed to, to have it for people who don't have to do anything, just attend the retreat. But say if you're the organizer of the retreat and you have some extra duty, uh, then we don't want to go over time to the Dharma talk and so on, so people can take time to rest. Because I remember about four days ago, we make a decision to, uh, to uh, clean up all the, the mat, uh, the cover for the mat. So that's about 500 of them, I think. Uh, so me and Michael, we, we took out and, uh, a couple of friends and then we take turns to, to wash them. And there's so much we can put in, in our washing machine and, uh, and dry it because otherwise it will break the heavy weight of things. So we have to, I did about five loaded. Uh, so the thing is I have to uh, pause and break between uh, different, like for example, before I go for a walk, I put in a load, I go for a walk and I come back, I put in a dry, something like that, you know. Uh, so to me, um, the schedule have a break is very important, and if you don't have extra responsibility, you can just relax and be aware of ha different things happening into your autonomous nervous system, and switch it so that it become a voluntary nervous system. And of course, the part about here is you have to water the good seed first of happiness, and not not to. Uh, to worry so much about what is going wrong. Uh, there are a lot of things that upset us in the White House, but also we have to pay attention to what is good going on here too. And uh, also have a co-practitioner. We have gratitude for that because the co-practitioner help us to, to relax and to be joyful. So having friends is very important. Uh, especially the friends of practice, friends who know how, how to practice, friends who can uh, know how to listen to you and not interrupt you. And of course, uh, develop a community or sangha. So many, many of friends come here, but sometimes you can, uh, if you live far, you can create a group of people that can uh, help to sit meditation and um, relax and um, have a motivation for practice. Often people um, think that, well, I want to do that, I want to do that, and then you try to do it alone, and after a while, you lose the interest. So having the inspiration for the practice is uh, very helpful. And we all learn about the, uh, the various diet system. Uh, when you, uh, you went on a diet, uh, and you lose weight, something, and then it doesn't sustain because you know. So I think it's just a matter of uh, um, pay more attention to the voluntary nervous system. It would help a lot. So I hope I don't get too technical on that. Uh, uh, so I'd like to to end. Uh, thank you very much for your patience, your attention.
So if you can uh, uncross your leg and massage your leg a little bit. Meanwhile, we have some announcements.